This is the You Winning Life Podcast, your number one source for mastering a positive existence. Each episode, we'll be interviewing exceptional people, giving you empowering insights, and guiding you to extraordinary outcomes. Learn from specialists in the worlds of integrative and natural wellness, spirituality, psychology, and entrepreneurship. So you too can be winning life. Now, here's your host, licensed marriage and family therapist, certified neuro emotional technique practitioner and certified entrepreneur coach jason wasser welcome back everybody today i have a really awesome guest that i've been looking forward to hanging out with for a while it's frank bria he's the founder of the high ticket program and he began his entrepreneurial career in the financial technology sector and he's worked with several startups some selling for hundreds of millions of dollars and some crashing and burning into flames. His experience includes helping some of the largest corporations on five continents grow their businesses by making a real impact on their customers and turning that into a scalable offering. And now he turns that experience to the small business sector where he works with consultants, coaches, and businesses, uh, authors to pivot away from the project-based and hourly revenue, the technician model as we're going to get into, right? Basically trading time for money. And his clients build their businesses around products and services where you leverage your time across multiple clients, not working just with one. And the process, he helps everybody get better results. He is also the host of the Six to Seven Figure Show podcast and author of the international best-selling book, Scale, How to Grow Your Business by Working Less and the father of three daughters. Frank, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Hey, thanks so much for being on the show. It's an honor. Awesome. Thanks so much. So you're out in Phoenix and you decided to leave the wonderful world of the East Coast to <laughs> head out there. Um, what got you out there from East Coast to, you know, really nice, chilled out environment? Yeah, right. Uh, actually, our first tech startup got me out here. So uh, a lot of people don't think of Phoenix as kind of the tech hotspot, but uh, we happen to have a, a tech startup that uh, was recruiting me to run their banking sector. And so I was actually um, back in Virginia at the time working for a bank and uh, they kind of dragged me out here and, and I have some software background. So it was kind of a nice match. And um, yeah, it's basically been here ever since. And it, it's been, it was a great place to raise the kids. They're all in college now. Uh, they're not, none of them are here anymore. But, uh, you know, once you get used to the winters here, it's really hard to go back to the East. <laughs> Very much understand. I've been to Phoenix once. I was actually at um, uh, Arizona State. And oh, yeah. one of the cool things was I was out there for a weekend doing a program on campus years ago. And I remember them like joking around. They're like, here's Scottsdale. And if at night you see anything blow up, it's just a meth house. And <laughs> It was like this the beautiful juxtaposition, side. right? It's yeah, this beautiful West. juxtaposition. Like, don't freak out, right? That's our <laughs> dichotomy of, of Phoenix. So it's interesting to know, but like everybody I met from there, I've always had a great, great time with. So yeah. let's go into, uh, right off the bat, your journey from where you started to where you're at now as a, as a professional. And as yeah. As a yeah, so so I actually um, w was going to be a math professor. Um, I uh, worked on my PhD in mathematics and uh, uh, was teaching at college for a number of years. And I love teaching; it's it's so much fun. I enjoy being in the classroom. And I know most people are like math, but that's actually what made it really challenging for me. Is I'd have people come into the class and they were like, "I hate this subject," and I'm like, "All right, bring it on, man. Let's let's, let's go." And um, they, it was just a lot of fun. Um, but it wasn't like I had other interests. And as a math, like even as a mathematician, I didn't really fit the role. Like I was a little, I, you know, my interests are a little more broad and I, I'd always kind of wanted to do something with business and, and law and accounting and other stuff. And so I wasn't really getting all of that there. Um, so I went into consulting, which is typically what you do, you know, if you leave academia. Right. Um, and I landed in the perfect spot. I went to Chicago and I joined a, a consulting firm there. Uh, and, it, you know, your, your mathematics, so you go into actuarial consulting because that's pretty much all you can do is for those people who don't know what actuarial stuff is, it's, it's those folks who are like figuring out the death tables and for life insurance. Like that's the, it's, it's really, really, you know, for a lot of people, it's just really awful, awful work. But um, you know, so they have kind of a track and they, you know, write it straight out of school, they stick you in a desk and you start, 
you know, uh, calculating, you know, dropping numbers into forms and stuff like that for clients. And um, I just, I lucked out. The company that I was with was a small boutique consulting firm. And they were like, okay, you're not our typical actuary. <laughs> um, you're not a typical guy we're going to throw uh, sort of on a desk and kind of, you know, crunch numbers. So um, they actually put me in front of clients and they had a software arm um, and they were building software to do uh, pension administration for, for benefits. And um, they basically were like, go, go talk to the clients and get their information and translate it for our uh, developers. And, and they were, it wasn't even like, Oh, we're going to babysit you with like a partner or anything like that. They just were like, go, just go. So I was in front of Fortune 500 clients almost like by month three, which I mean, anyone who's been in that industry knows that's, a, that's like ridiculous. They just don't do that. Right. Um, and they, they trusted me and they let me fail a couple of times and they didn't punish me for it. They knew we were trying something new. And I was in front of Fortune 500 companies like, you know, three, four months out of college. It was an amazing experience. I mean, everything that I know about consulting to this day, from the way to handle clients all the way down to, um, you know, proofing deliverables. And, you know, we put a, a booklet together and having someone literally go through it page by page to make sure that every page is there and like every little thing, it, it was just an amazing experience. Um, so I started there and, um, uh, I, I, uh, from there went to basically I moved from insurance into banking. Insurance was kind of not my thing. And I kind of went into banking from there. So pivoted into banking and, and then the tech startup stuff happened. And like I mentioned, I came out to Phoenix. Um, they was recruited out, uh, for a tech startup here and, uh, and, and grew their banking practice. We got acquired, um, the, uh, the CEO of that company, and I started another one, uh, that moved through, we got our IP licensed, uh, by another big mortgage uh, provider and, and, you know, then we, another one and that one crashed and another one. And, you know, it's, so it just kind of went on from there, but that, that experience of running a couple of those, uh, tech companies, um, that I kind of developed a specialty specialty mm -hmm. in that area. And so then I started to get called out consulting with, uh, other vendors and financial institutions all over the world. So it grew into a consulting practice of my own. And I was, I was the Frank, we need you in Johannesburg in three days guy. Like it was all over the, the world. And I got my million miler status on all the airlines in the United States and, you know, a couple uh, elite status on foreign airlines and you know, uh, Israeli security one time thought I was a spy because of the stamps on my passport. So, like, and they have the best security. Ever. <laughs> oh, wow. I've been to Israel like, a bunch of times, so I know. Yeah. yeah, it is absolutely something else. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I had this really successful consulting practice, and but I was the product. You know, I mean, if, if I wasn't there, it wasn't going to work. Um, and then one day I'm in Kiev. Uh, and I'm about to meet a, uh, a financial institution there. And, um, right as I'm walking into the meeting, I find out that we have a major medical emergency with the family at home. Hmm. And I did the unthinkable, the thing that everyone worries about they're going to have to do at a meeting like this, where, you know, people have flown in from all over Eastern Europe for this meeting and we're just starting. And I stand up and say, I'm sorry, I have to leave. Wow. I have to get to the airport right now and go home and cancel the meeting. Like, no, there's nothing anyone can do and, and walk out. And of course, there's not a direct flight from Kiev to Phoenix. So <laughs> it was a good 36 hour trip home to think about what I had built and that it wasn't at all what I had wanted to do when I went out on my own and, and started my own business. Um, I got kids growing up, they're growing up kind of not really seeing me as much. Um, you know, there's this major medical thing. I can't be there. You know, by the time I got home, a lot of that stuff had already kind of, uh, run through, you know, and, and, uh, and I, we had to rely on friends and neighbors and all this other kind of stuff. And I just was like, this isn't what I want. Like, this isn't what I really wanted to do. Um, so as things kind of calmed down a little bit, I realized I, I don't want to be this traveling consultant anymore. That's not, not, you know, it's fun and exciting and it looks really glamorous. But it's actually really exhausting. Um, 
and it wasn't really giving me the life that I wanted to have. Yeah. Um, and I realized that if I dropped dead somewhere on a tarmac or something like that, that my kids got have pretty much nothing because there's n- nothing to sell in this business. No assets. Like if I'm not the product, it's right. gone. You're the asset. Yeah, I'm the asset. Right. right. And so, um, I, uh, I said, okay, well, this has got to change. And so I started to go through the process of changing around, uh, what I was doing, uh, to provide service for clients. And, um, and I screwed it up and there was no manual. No one was like how to become, how to go from consultant to online entrepreneur. So, you know, first thing I did is I called up all my clients and said, I'm not traveling anymore. And I lost half of them overnight. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I started to um, change and deliver services online. Uh, and, uh, and so I was like reading all of the stuff online. People were publishing about information products and membership sites and all that kind of stuff. And so I was doing, I was trying to follow their map. Um, but it made me look small and chintzy. Like it, you know, I went from, you know, I'm, I'm $5,000 a day to, Oh, and you can get my PDF for 300 bucks. It was not, the same thing. And so I lost the other half of my clients <laughs> from that. And so I had to rebuild from scratch and realize, okay, this isn't the right model. There's got to be a different model. Um, and interestingly enough, what I had been doing for my clients is helping proceduralize their services offerings. <laughs> and so I was like, duh, I-, I need to just do what I've been teaching all of them. I just didn't think it would work at such a small level, right? I was working with large corporations and thinking it has to be at scale. Um, and what I realized was you can build for scale and not be at scale. And that was the breakthrough. Like that was, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I don't need like $3 million to do this. I just need, um, I just need a scalable offering and I need delivery mechanisms. And so I started to study you know, what people were doing, the, the folks who were successful and looked at the patterns and um, broke it down and, you know, created the beginnings of what now is high ticket program. And um, now we work with uh, entrepreneurs and help them make the same shift. Wow. So it's, it's, uh, it's been a, a, quite a ride, but it's, it's, well, it, it, you know, it's ended well. Yeah. And it makes so much sense that like, like we were talking about pre, pre our conversation, how this is how we're trained to yeah. go into business, right? We go to school, we learn a specific craft, uh, whether it's vocational, technical, whatever it may be, right? And then we go and become the technician. And I know there's a lot of people that when they stumble upon this aha moment, right? The the whole e-myth Michael Gerber philosophy right. of yeah, exactly. entrepreneur, technician, I'm sorry, entrepreneur, manager, and technician. And they get that shift of the mindset that things radically change for them. But then there's this whole guilt of like 20 something years or 30 something years of like society mindset and pressure on top of them to do something differently that doesn't involve them being the person giving the results. Right. And, and and focusing on your, you know, what you've built. I mean, there's the sunk cost philosophy, right. Where it's like, well, I mean, I heard a lot of people say, well, Frank, you're the banking expert. Like, you know, why, why, why are you trying to do something different? Why are you trying to change what you do? Like you had a working model. Yeah. I mean, it was hard. And then you get all these other folks. So it's like, it's work. It's hard. Like work is hard, (laughs) you know, and, and all of that really, there's just a sort of cultural pressure to sort of stay in this box that you've set for yourself. And even if the box isn't working for you, um, you know, stay in. And I guess it took me a while to realize that a lot of people, as is with a lot of things, I guess, a lot of people were really just giving themselves the advice. Like they're, they're talking from their own, you know, insecurities rather than actually trying to give you advice. Um, right. In a lot of ways, people create their own jail of yeah. the life that they've chosen to live, blaming the environment around them, blaming their culture, their family, their schooling, their lack of whatever it may be, yeah. but they willingly chose that along the way. And I think that's one of the big things that does keep people massively stuck in those type of experiences. Yeah. And I've seen that as a therapist, right? When I, No one trained us. So I graduated 2005 from graduate school. No one ever said anything about growing a practice where it involves having a whole team of people. It's the whole idea of like you having a six figure private practice makes you a success. But I remember sitting on a panel 
God, that'd be like six years ago, at least, um, when I was on the local association for marriage and family therapists and it was about the like private practice panel. And I remember them like at that point, they're like, yeah, the six figure practice, the six figure practice. And you had people who were working for agencies, right? Community mental health agencies. You had some people maybe who were dipping their toe into private practice after hours. And you had some people yeah. who were fully, right? They made it when they leave the agency world and now they're a real therapist. And they're just talking about this six figure private practice. And I'm like, I'm not making six figures. My business might be making six figures. I'm not yeah. taking home six figures, right. <laughs> right? So all this time, effort, and energy that I'm spending to build this practice or build this company or build this business, I'm still getting paid no differently than someone working at an agency or someone even yeah. working at Starbucks, right, right at that time. And exactly. I don't have to worry about, you know, paying the bills at Starbucks. Here, I have to worry about paying the bills and right. and mopping and answering the phones and more. So I want people to understand how powerful this concept is that you're helping people create in their lives. Um, because my side is, let me help you get out of it psychologically to see what you can do. And then you're the perfect person for them to go to, right? <laughs> so then now what are the multiple platforms in which you can put it out there? Where would you say is like the first step that someone psychologically, from your perspective, yeah. um, psychologically, mentally, mindset, whatever you want to call it, that they have to, to adjust or shift to start looking at things from no longer being this, I'm the technician, yeah. everything's built around me, and here's how I reproduce and replicate how, what I can do for multiple people. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of books. You talked about e-myth that, you know, there's, there's a lot of writing around um, what, what goes into, you know, being a manager of a, of a larger organization. I mean, our motto at high ticket program is six figure practice to seven figure enterprise. That's our motto. So y there's a lot of discussion around how, how you get there and how you have to kind of let go and be the leader and, bring other people in and trust and all that stuff. So, but, but there's a lot missing out of that. I, and I want to touch on that one thing. Um, before you can even get to that place where you start thinking about managing and letting go and all of the stuff that it takes to become a CEO, um, I think there's this one thing that is in there first. We, I think as, as people, as human beings have a tendency when we're in a position of stress or fear to think down rather than to think up. So there's this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm panicked about my business, lower prices, right? I'm panicked. I'm not sure where mo the money's going to come from. Um, open up the net to wider, you know, to, to, to take in people I don't want to take. Like there's this, there's this movement of fear down. Like you, we, we have to push beyond that. Like the, the best thing that we can do is to start, um, honing in, focusing and thinking up. Um, I kind of like it. I wrote a blog post a, a, a few years back and I resurrected it a couple of weeks ago because I think it's apropos. Like uh, th there's, there's this um, analogy between like airline or like a, a plane, plane, pi like plot pilots or flying a plane, right? If you stall, which means that the airflow over the wing isn't fast enough to keep the plane in the air anymore. The pilot has two choices. They can pull back on the stick to go higher or they can push down, push in to have the plane actually point down to the ground. And, um, you know, you're in a plane that's about to crash. You, you have a bit of a tendency to want to like stay away from the ground. And so, uh, the pilots have like this instinct to kind of keep away from the ground. And so they'll pull back, which actually keeps the plane going up higher. But that's actually the exact wrong thing to do because it actually reduces the airspeed over the wings and causes the plane to stall even further. What, what the pilot has to do is exactly the opposite of their instinct, and that is to point the plane towards the ground to speed the airflow over the wings. And a lot of airline pilots make this mistake and there are crashes. You know, planes crash because of this mistake. And, and it's perfectly applicable to us as entrepreneurs. Like when we're in a tough spot or we have to make a change, we, we want to stay away from the ground. We want to crash. And so we do things we think are safe that are going to keep us away. We stop spending money. We lower our prices. We open up the, you know, the aperture of our marketing to everybody. But those things actually lower the airspeed over our wings. They make us less efficient, less effective, less attractive. Um, and what we have to do is the exact opposite. So the, the first thing I think anyone has to do when they move from practitioner to entrepreneur is to start thinking about themselves as the prize, as the valuable entity that they are. And, um, 
raise your price and focus in on the clients that you really want to work with and understand that, you know, there are people here in this world you're not meant to serve. And that's cool. Um, that's actually a part of, you know, a part of understanding your target market and your value proposition. But until we can do that, until we can resist this temptation to think down, we're going to have a hard time building anything up because the very first thing I ask our clients to do is to raise their prices, sometimes double, triple, and immediately it's deer in the headlights, right? Because that's not what they think they need to do right now. Right. And there's a fear, there's a fear of lack and someone's going to get rejected. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So that's the, that's what I would say would be the, you know, there's, again, there's tons of writing about letting go and being the manager and, you know, understanding that you need to trust other people and all that stuff. But to me, this feels like the thing that's missing. It doesn't get talked about a lot. Yeah. So, and I think right now, especially with what's going on with the pandemic around us, that people are a rightfully freaking out, right? Let's first acknowledge sure. that we have the right yeah. to freak out in this scenario. Totally. Right. Number two, after we do our freak out, then my, my thing that I've been giving, and I've been doing a lot of online workshops for young professionals specifically, uh, in addition to talking to my clients, my therapy and my coaching clients is what's your pivot, right? If yeah. you're now seeing why just being a direct service worker, whether you're a teacher or whether you have a restaurant or whether you're a personal trainer, why it's so important to have the pivot, of how, what are the 15 different ways that I can be producing income during this time? But you can also see that when you are the prize and you are the only service that can be provided and it can only be offered in person with a person in front of you, how we're screwing ourselves and limiting our possibilities and capabilities. But I think one of the hidden blessings out of this time period is that people are going to be forced to radically think differently, right? So for my practice, I have long wanted to be online, but never really presented it to my clients. And I kind of dropped hints here and there. I'm like, you know, one day, like maybe I won't live in Florida, you know, and would you still want to see me, right? As long as I keep my license for therapy in Florida. And they're like, yeah, of course I would want to do that online. But then they're like, but that's a long time away, right? And I'm like, yeah, 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 you know, I'm not going anywhere for now. And within the span of like two weeks ago, right? I was in Asheville, North Carolina with my, my buddy Pablo. We were doing a retreat for some entrepreneurs um, at his, at his um, up, up in Asheville. And I had to come home on Sunday. And within three hours, I had to send an email to all my clients saying, this is not a possibility. This is what's happening. And I yeah. languaged it in a way where it wasn't, would you like to do this? It was, this is what I'm doing. You will be receiving, a, here's the link for you to sign on at the time of your session as if, and I gave them the whole setup as if they were coming to my office. Yeah. Here are the new rules. In other yeah. words, all the rebuttals were put in there. All of the, so I really had to be strategic about it. And I see how many other people now in like Facebook groups, especially in therapy groups, like, oh, I'm still seeing a few clients in my office. How do I get them to come to me online? And people are afraid of making yeah. that jump to doing something different, whether it's pivoting online right now or creating a new product for them to right. sell. And, and I think some of that fear is based in this idea that somehow um, online or virtual or group or leveraged or scalable is less. And so it's like, well, I don't want to let my clients down. But in fact, what I'll tell you is uh, we'll just take coaching as an example, um, because as part of what we do at High Ticket Program, we worked with dozens and dozens of coaches. One of the things that we found is a really well executed group coaching program is more effective than one on one coaching. And, and the reason, and again, it, it, it can't be if you just are lazy about it and you're like, oh, we're just going to do this online. Now you have to you have to design it. But here's what happens in groups. Like we, and we know this from, we know this from like their group therapy programs, there's group educational programs. We know that human beings are the right dynamic in a group get actually more out of the experience than they do one-on-one. And so, um, you know, we have group coaching programs that introduce this idea of having a mix of people with different experience levels in the group and um, participating actively where they're helping each other, right? So again, learning theory, we know this. Um, if I teach a principle to a client, that's one thing. If they do that principle, it's another thing. If they then teach that principle back to somebody else, because it's part of the interaction routine, well, then we've really nailed it, right? I mean, 
that's that becomes much more effective. Um, and we see it in corporate consulting work as well. One of the clients that we work with, um, they're a software company, large software company that that does uh, workforce planning uh, for uh, for diverse locations. So they have to like fly their people out mm-hmm. to do workforce planning on site. Well, they're not flying out right now. You know, no one's traveling. So we worked with them about okay. So how is this going to shift? Like, how does onboarding and, and implementation and support how's that all shift? Well, one of the big shifts they made. I mean, they made a ton of them, but one really interesting one is they used to have sort of checklists for implementation that their consultants would go out and do. So okay, they're going to walk their clients through. Well, let's let's go through like has this been done? Has this been done? Has this been done? Well, those checklists are now self-checklists because they have to give them to their client. Well, they are far more engaging, far more effective as self-assessments than they ever were as clipboard-carrying consultants. And so this shift to a virtual, the shift to scalable and leveraged it can actually be and is often a good thing when it's designed correctly. So again, there's, I think there's this fear that, oh, if I do this, I'm cheating my clients. I'm giving them less. Um, there's nothing better I can do for them than to give them my time. And, and it's that mindset that is keeping us trapped. Yeah, completely agree. And I know that one of the most challenging, um, and positively challenging part of group. Let me let me let me let me preface it that way. Is that there also becomes accountability, not just to the person facilitating the group, but there also becomes accountability to each other as peers. Right. Because especially if there's a theme um, in the group, right? Like, and it doesn't matter even if it's coaching, not coaching, whatever industry. Like, I think like on a macro level, if you um, if you bring together people over a shared theme. It, then it doesn't matter where they're at in that, but they're going to want to be accountable to each other, but they're also not going to want to um, do less work than the other people. Right. So there yeah. is more of a buy-in. There is more of a longitudinal uh, effect that I'm going to stick it out because I don't want to just disappear because what might people think, which is a little bit of a psychological trick in that regards. But people do based on, right. Like, like the research you're showing and talking about, they want to be able to, show that they're handling this, that they're doing this, that they're showing up and they're doing the work and they don't want to disappoint someone else, even if they have no accountability to them at the end of the day. Right. Well, it's, it's a behavioral economics thing. So this is one of the reasons why masterminds are so effective. And by mastermind, I mean a real mastermind. A lot of people are like, I wrote a book and I'm going to have a mastermind and they don't really know what they're talking about. I'm talking about a true mastermind, which is like a group of people who come together to help each other accomplish a particular goal. And it's facilitated by someone, but that facilitator is not the guru. They're not the one who is teaching one. They're kind of all keeping each other accountable. Well, behavioral economics tells us that um, if I'm, if I hire you, Jason, and you ask me to do something, I'm going to be less concerned about disappointing you because I pay you. <laughs> like you're kind of my employee. So if I, if I don't do it, it's like, it's okay. Cause I'm the boss, but in a group setting where you're not paying each other, that level of accountability is a higher, this feeling of, well, I don't want to, like, these are my peers. So there isn't that, you know, there's an economic factor to play in it. it it's bizarre. It's backwards, but right. it's a behavioral economics thing that is kind of interesting dynamic that uh, well, I think that right that shared experience right the the, the right. again if you're creating a group out there and if you're someone like um, I know one of the communities that I was in they're talking about what do I do to pivot my business shut down and I was looking through their list of um, qualifications and I'm like have you thought about doing this online but for the first 30 days offering it for free create a lot of value and the first mm-hmm. thought was like no but I have to make money I'm like yeah but people don't know that you do this outside of your little circles. So, you know, it's that Gary V, right? Jab, 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 right hook type of thing. Right. Create tons and tons and tons of value and then make your ask. And you can say this, right? I'm going to be doing this for 30 days free after that. And you can put it out there up front, right? Afterwards, I will be asking for X, Y, and Z, but I want you to come experience what this is like. And it's going to be no different whether you're paying now or you're getting for free now, but in 30 days I will be charging, but I want you to come experience this with me and I want to give you this result, right? And you can have a massive result. You might not meet me in 30 days, but that's even better of a testimonial, right? So I want people out there to hear this, that don't be afraid, especially right now to have a short term offering where you're creating a tremendous amount of value. And I think like what you just said about mastermind, like the cliche-ness or the overuse of the word mastermind, 
like there's a few buzzwords that, you know, like yeah. CEO, just because you've opened, you're, you're doing something on like you're, you're, so you're doing social media marketing or you're doing this doesn't make you a CEO, right? Let's see you and I know that because we've worked in, right. In, 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 in larger companies and corporations, but I don't consider myself the CEO of my business because I'm also providing therapy and coaching. So yeah. right, the CEO doesn't do that, that at the micro level. So I'm the founder and owner of my company, but I wouldn't ever call myself the CEO of my company because it's, not right. And the whole thing, like a mastermind, I agreed, right. It's a specific accountability on a specific goal that everybody is like-minded about and working in the same direction, unified, and everybody's able to call each other out or see blind spots for each other, but it's very, very, very specific. And yeah. I think that the, the, the third thing was the concept of the value. I think that word right now is like how many times, especially right. You're being, you're, you're being on social media on a podcast um, and in the entrepreneur circles, that word value has become like the Lululemon of yoga yeah. pants, right? If you wear Lululemon, all of a sudden you're a yogi, right? So the word value, I think, has become, and I joke around with my buddy Pat Hilton about that. Like he has his value flakes. It's like frosted flakes, but he put value flakes on it, right? And like we both make fun of like, oh, I'm going to provide them a tremendous amount of value. Right. <laughs> How can we really... I mean, again, like I'm being tongue in cheek about this, but there's something beyond value that we need to offer. Yeah. And for me, I think it's integrity. I think it's... Um, actually something that does solve a problem. And it's very clearly expressed on how you can help them do that. Absolutely. That, that is the key. I mean, um, what, one of the things that sort of underlies everything that you talked about is we have to identify a tangible, relevant outcome that our client actually cares about, right? So we can dump the word value and still be talking about an outcome. One of, one of the things that we, we talk with our clients is, what is the six-figure problem you're solving? What is the seven-figure problem you're solving? And we, and, we, and we articulate it that way because we want to push people, right? So we say, like, what does your client have at the end of working with them that they didn't have before? And um, a lot of people who are in the coaching space or in the soft skills space, uh, they get, they get concerned about this because, again, they think about, well, it's value. And so we get great, articulate the value. And, uh, and so the, the very first thing that comes out of their mouth is, when, when my client's done working with me, they will have clarity around. And I go, stop. <laughs> clarity is not an outcome. They can't do anything with clarity. Clarity doesn't help them at all. Clarity helps them take the next step but clarity is not an outcome. So, you know, look, there's four reasons why people buy stuff in this world. Literally, they want to make money, they want to save money, they want to stay out of jail, or they want to have a better life. That's it. That's it. So you got to align what it is you're doing with one of those four things and figure it out. But, it, it, you know, if, if you stop too soon, you know, if your value proposition, if your value is, wow, they really come out of a conversation with me clear on their next steps, that's not good enough. Like, is it a plan? Are they taking the next steps? When are they taking the steps? Have they taken the steps with you? So one of the things we do when, when clients tell us, well, I don't think I solve a six-figure problem. I think I solve a five-figure problem or maybe even a four-figure problem. Mm -hmm. We're like, great. That means we just have to expand the, uh, the, the window of, of how you're engaging, right? So you start asking your questions. What do people do before they hire me? What do they do after they hire me? How do I wrap my arms around that entire thing? You know, um, social media marketing is a classic example. Like I post Instagram folks for people. Like I post, I, I manage people's Instagram accounts. Great. But they're not waking up at two o'clock in the morning thinking, oh my gosh, if I could just have an amazing Instagram account. They're thinking, where are the clients coming from, right? And so what are you doing as the Instagram poster person to facilitate the thing that your client really cares about? And most practitioners are stuck as one cog in an overall value chain. And so the first thing that we have to do is break ourselves out of that cog and become the value chain, like own it. That doesn't mean we have to do it all ourselves. We can find strategic partners. We can find vendors that we trust, et cetera. But we have to be seen as the one-stop shop for the thing our clients really care about, like the, what they're really waking up at two o'clock in the morning worrying about. Yeah. And, I, and it really hits home because I had this conversation yesterday with a client where they had the aha moment in our, in our call. And then I'm like, okay, so now you got that. Therefore, what? 
Yeah. <laughs> right. And they answered, I'm like, great. So therefore what? And right. And I did that probably five or six times. And I'm like, by the way, you're going to get really annoyed at me in the next few minutes. Cause you know what the next question is going to be until we finally hit that wall. That's where we need to go. And I'm finding that like so many people out there are afraid to ask the therefore what, or that next question. And I see it in business, but I also see it in relationships and dating where yeah. you're experiencing something or you're hoping that there's going to be an outcome. And then the person's like, okay, good. I got that. And then they don't clarify and get through, okay, so now what do I do with that? What do I want to do with that? What's the result I want to have? Yeah. And, and, and it's so interesting how, and I truly believe this, that entrepreneurship is a platform for personal uh, development and for pr- reaching purpose, uh, purpose. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, totally. But I, but I see the same patterns. What's that phrase? As you do something is as you do everything. Right. So the people's patterns, all of our patterns will show up. And when I ask a client when they're stuck, whether it's a business coaching client or a therapy client, I'm like, and where is this showing up in the same pattern in another aspect of your life that has nothing to do with this? Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm fine over there. And I'm like, okay, so are you telling me you've never done this? And I macro, right? The lens out yeah. about yeah. that pattern and then apply it to there. And they're like, oh shit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm like, okay, now we can get to the nitty gritty. Right, right. So exactly. That's where the fun really starts to happen. When I, cause I talk, I'm, I'm you know, I, I call myself a pattern person. I'm very good at, pat, you know, identifying patterns, both in your behavior, but also very much in language how you talk about the problem is more the problem than the problem yeah. itself. Yeah. Right. And, and I think what you're saying about like the social media, that cog in the wheel, how fun is it for you to find that spot? Like it's like developmental stages of a child, right? You, you know, this as a, as, a, as a parent, like, you know, like at developmental stages, there's gonna be certain things that they're going to get stuck at. Yeah. Are you able to identify based on where they're at in their professional identity career, whether it's like they've been working for corporate America for 20 years and now they're doing something on their own or they've been a a solopreneur, right? They've been trying to go at it alone in their own business that there's developmental stages for different things. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the very first, the very first problem we tackle is, you know, what's your, what six figure, seven figure problem are you trying to solve for your client? And that feels like psychology, which I'm not adept at. So, so uh, I tell people I'm not a coach, I'm a consultant, but you know, I can play one on TV. Um, in, In a lot of my clients, this is the work we have to do. There's so much head trash around actually stepping out and doing something and being of value. And it's not just, it's not just fear that I'm not going to, um, I, I don't have it in me. It's fear of disappointing the client. It's fear of like standing in service of the client and saying, I commit that I'm, if you hire me, I'm going to get you where you want to go. And this I think is missing from so many service businesses. There are, especially in the like business coaching space, one of the biggest problems I see is a lack of accountability to the client to deliver the outcome, right? It's like, well, I teach you, if you don't do it, not my problem. That's your problem. Well, that's bogus. That's BS. It's not true. It is my responsibility actually to hold you accountable and give you the support mechanisms to do it. I mean, of course it's hard. If it was, if it was easy, you wouldn't need a coach. Um, you know, like, a coach doesn't just stand on the sidelines and go, oh, well, you're not running. So I'm just going to run the stopwatch and see kind of how long you stay there at the starting blocks. That's, that's not what a coach does. So we just, we, we've lost this, hey, I admit to you as my client that we're going to get there. This is the outcome. And I have built all of the support infrastructure you need to get there. Skills accountability and mentorship, all of it, not just skills. Don't just watch a course. That's not enough. Like it, it, it's one of those things where we, we just have to go that extra step to, to stand in service. And yeah, it's scary. Like, of course it's scary. Like you're, you're putting yourself out there. It's a, it's a position of vulnerability. So from a developmental standpoint, the first thing we have to do is just get them through that phase of, you no, know, you, you need to be committed to this concept. And it's going to be, you say, uh, one of the things I love you say, cause I say it all the time is that, you know, entrepreneurship is a, about a personal development process. 
I, you cannot build a business without going through a personal development process. It's, it's impossible. Uh, and, and it's hard and it's painful. And a lot of times I'll have conversations with my clients where they're like, yeah, I don't know, Frank, this just kind of doesn't feel like me, what you're asking me to do. It's like, not really my style. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not, cause, that, I'm not that type of guy. Right. right. I'm like, cause, cause I'm like, yeah. Cause when you came here, you were making $5,000 a month and now you're making $50,000 a month. So yeah, it isn't your style. Like, did you think it was? <laughs> that's not, of course you're going to change. Of course it's going to hurt. Like that's the way it goes. But um, yeah, it, it is a completely development a process. There's an absolute development uh, phases to it. So what would you say to the people out there, right? Because obviously at the end of the day, there's two uh, fear factors when it comes to what my coach Rick Sapio calls the Superman or Superwoman syndrome. I got to do yeah. it all by myself. Right. I, right? I can't trust anybody with the secret recipe. And if I do and I empower them, they're just going to go off and start their own thing. Right? So that's one big fear factor. Yeah. Um, right? When they're bringing in associates or employees under them to build their business, um, is that right? They're going to at one level maybe get screwed out of, um, out of proprietary information. Right. But the other side is, how do I know that the money that I'm going to be investing in this will 100% without a doubt get me the results in return to the amount that I put into it? Yeah. So, so there's a couple of things there. The first one's a trust issue. Um, and, um, you know, there, there's, um, there, there's two ways to attack that, right? One is a, as, as a therapy and counseling thing around trust, which I'm not going to touch because it's not my area of expertise, but there are definitely but now you know who just does them too. Yeah. Yeah. Go to Jason. Jason will work with you. There, there are definitely people who have, um, you know, a past or baggage or youth or whatever, where trust is like seriously something that needs to be worked through that. I mean, a lot of us, a lot of us have that, but there's another thing which isn't really about emotional baggage. It's more about mindset or perspective. And I liken it to the same conversation I have with founders of uh, companies that have to go get funding, right? So um, I have a company, it's doing okay, but I need, you know, $5 million to, to grow the company. And, I, and I've been in this spot because I've gone and asked for $6 million to start a company. So I know how it goes. And of course, the people who are willing to give you the money, if you have a good enough idea, and they want to take a part of the company as part of that, right? They're investing. Yep. So they're going to take a part of the company. So I've seen so many founders who get stuck exactly at this spot where they get past the hard part. The hard part is getting someone to give you the money. That's the hard part, okay? Once they offer to give you money and they got a term sheet and they're looking at a term sheet and they're like, oh, wait, how much do you want? You want you want 40% of my business? Oh, wow. Like that's a lot of my business for this money. And I'm like, what are you insane? Like you don't have a business. You've got, you're making like $200,000 a year and you've got someone who's going to give you $5 million to grow something and they want 40%. Well, duh. Like the moment you take their money, you're suddenly, you own 60% of a $5 million business. Like you don't, you didn't have that before, you know? But people get stuck there. They get stuck at the spot of like, I don't want to give it away. But you have to realize that uh, you do have to give it away to grow. Like you do have to split it up. And that does mean bringing people in. That means taking a risk. You absolutely are going to hire someone who screws you one day. Like it is going to happen. Like it's just part of how it works. Um, and yeah, like I, I almost never hire someone who's not an entrepreneur or has a side project. Like even folks who do administrative stuff for me, I ask them like, what do you do on the weekends? Like what's your, what's your side hustle? I want people motivated that way. Does that mean they're more likely to leave to start their own thing? Probably. But I get way more benefit from the time they're with me than someone who is, is watching the clock and punching, you know, punch in their time clock. Uh, well, while it's a mindset working. thing, right? I think totally that, is. Yeah. Right? And, and I'm wondering as I'm thinking about it, like uh, of all the years that I've been doing this, right? That people are, have the tendency to, to be very binary, either a, I'm a control freak or B I'm so not a control. Freak. Right. <laughs> but, but that example that you just gave about the $5 million contract and having to pay a percentage really will show how much of a control freak Right. And I'm right. using that in, in playful right. terms, right? Uh, how much of a control freak they actually might be. Because I always say, listen, right now you have a zero dollar business. And would you rather have 60% of a five million dollar business or would you rather have zero percent of a zero dollar business? Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly the way you were saying it. 
And people really, because again, we're trained to be, if it's mine, I'll pay you out of the pot once it comes in. Right. And then, right, whatever's left over is mine anyway. But you're going to make so much more money if you have those right partners, the trustable uh, investors, stuff like that, right. where everything is very clear and everything's very, um, you know, the terms are very, very authentic and integrity based and legally based. Um, you're going to get way more out of that investment yeah. than yeah. you would trying to go at it yourself. I'm like, nope, I'm just going to, I'll be fine. I'm just going to suck it up and I'm going to be stuck at $80,000 because I yeah. don't want anybody to make any percentage off of me. I'm the one well, who's smart. It's interesting. I mean, because I always joke, like there are no Fortune 500 one man shows, you know. <laughs> but um, the 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 but actually, if you look at the census data in the United States, because we did this analysis a couple of years ago, it's really fascinating. In the service business industry, the one man shops um, they uh, top out somewhere between two hundred and four hundred thousand dollars a year. That's it. Now, some people might be listening and going, "Wow, if I can make four hundred thousand dollars a year, that's amazing." No, that's the ceiling. That's the that's it. There's no and more. That's not selling that. a product. That's selling that's you a as service. A that's driving, yeah, you as the product. So there's a natural ceiling to this business model. It, it just, it doesn't grow. It's not like if you're just smart enough or good enough or talented enough that you can somehow make it. Um, that's one of the reasons why we say six figure practice to seven figure enterprise, because you can't make it to seven figures on that business model. You have to change. There's no choice um, that you, you won't get there uh, from here. You've, you've got to change what you're doing to get there. Yeah. And what would you say is like the average timeline from someone saying, okay, man, like, I love it. I love what you're saying. I love what you're doing. You have proof of concept, which is obviously the most important thing, right? To convince someone to want to do it uh, with you, to partner with you. Um, what would you say is like the average timeline of someone who has something that's successful, they're doing well, maybe they're at that like cusp of like six figure business, maybe they're in the mid range of six figures, right? Of 150 and they yeah. want to go now to that $300,000 range. Like what would be that time frame? you would say like, listen, like be patient. It's not going to happen overnight. You might actually see a little bit of a decrease at first. Don't freak out, right? Which I'm assuming could happen. Here's what, but here's the average of what my clients see. Like, what would you say to that? Yeah. Um, so, uh, it, it, I'm, I'll give you the standard consulting answer, which is it depends. But I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you some guidelines that we see. The hardest thing is actually getting from zero to around 200. <clears throat> That's the hard part. The uh, there, there's so much. Um, you know, blood, sweat, and tears that goes into that. It's a lot of elbow grease. Uh, that that is, you know, proving out the the uh, the model and making sure you've got something worse. Once you're at sort of that, you know, call it two hundred thousand plus or minus, it's about a two year journey to seven figures. And um, once you're at about two hundred thousand, it's a fairly standard journey. Um, it, and again, think things are different. It's going to be easier if you're, uh, you know, an IT professional, uh, that works with, uh, you know, mid-sized companies than if you're a pet massage expert, you know, <laughs> like it's, it's a harder switch, right? Is it, we're going to have to pivot business model. We're going to have to pivot, uh, value proposition. All of that stuff has to happen, but it's easier if you can, um, if you have a higher valued service, um, generally speaking, you know, cause we, we typically work with a B2B, uh, folks, you know, consultants, that's kind of our bread and butter. Um, the principles work broadly across the board, but uh, B2B is an easier, easier task. Um, we actually see uh, that as long as you get that value proposition right, your prices actually can go up almost instantly. So we don't see a dip in that case. Uh, if you are B2C, like let's say, for example, that you like your personal trainer, and you like go into a gym all the time. And it, it really is your physical time. That's like you're sitting in the gym trying to land clients in the gym or something like that. Then yeah, you might see a slight dip because you're going to have to pull back on that time to invest in, um, in building something else. But generally speaking, uh, if you have that six figure, seven figure problem, right? We're usually raising prices for folks. I, I don't, um, I'm trying, I'm trying to think if we, We've never lowered the price for anyone, um, but we, it, you know, we'll typically double their prices almost out of the shoot. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes sense because I think that if you're devaluing yourself off the bat, then you're never going to 
yeah. where you want to go. I remember my oh. dad told me this story. He had a buddy of his that he grew up with from Scranton. And um, I think the guy moved to Texas. He became a psychologist. Um, and my dad told me the story that when he first opened his practice, he found uh, the therapist in that area who charged the most. Yeah. Moved into their building and charged ten dollars more an hour than they did. <laughs> and I'm That's like, think about this. My dad told me this when I started my practice, mm-hmm. and I'm like, okay. And then like, well, so what did he say when people called? He goes, well, I'm better. You know, it's like, well, that person's been working for this many years. He goes, yeah, but I have newer education. I have more, right? I'm, I have more. I have the cutting edge stuff. That guy's been doing the same stuff for twenty years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's all, it's all a pivot. And it's it really all- is. It's the mi- mindset. It really is. I mean, it starts with mindset. It really does help if you've got, some people are naturally good at positioning themselves, but, but I think most of us suffer from the cobbler's kid have no shoes kind of uh, approach. We can, we're really good at giving advice and giving you know to other people, but we don't take our own advice. And that's true even for me. I mean, I've sat around plenty of times going, I'm not really sure what kind of product I should build. And people are like, Frank, you're the product guy. What the What's your problem? But uh, we all kind of need an outside perspective. And it's useful to have someone that you're soundboarding off of who can say, I mean, and you get this because you're, you're a therapist. So it's always good to have a, that outside person to go, okay, let me reflect back what you just said to me and see if it makes sense, if it's what you thought you were saying. Um, and that's true even in business with business value propositions and and uh, formulating how things are going to work. And I'm a fan of validation. Like, uh, you know, when you're in a service business I, and, you're, and you're trying to adjust what you do, I don't like the digital marketing model that's happened because it keeps people from talking to each other. Um, I'm like, just pick up the phone and like say, hey, I've got an idea. Like, I, I want to run you through my idea. Like, do you think it makes sense? Like, Instead, we're like, oh no, put up a landing page and drive paid traffic to it and see if anyone signs up. Like I just, it loses all of that ability to get that feedback. Well, it's also like, you know, the douchebaggery of what we call entrepreneurship at this (laughs) point. And I really have no embarrassment in calling that out, right? Living in South Florida, I think I feel like I'm partially in the epicenter of it with, with some of the things that are going on here. Um, you're a little bit more buffered in, in, in being in, you know, oh, LA is close enough. <laughs> LA is close enough. Right, right, right. But, but at least, you know, at least they're like, when they're saying like, I'm a health coach, they're actually living the life. Right. And they're actually like, you know, paying for their $13 four ounce juices. Um, and then their $60 yoga classes, but they're actually going to the classes, even though like, you know, they don't really have a client that they can't, you know, whatever, but they're living the life, right. At least a little bit more than I would say they are in Miami. Um, here it's just like, you know, the glitz and the glamour of it. Um, and everybody's rising and grinding. But I know that like the experience that I've had over the years as being the mindset, and I, and I share this, this, this um, experience a lot with people, is that I was the therapist and the healer. I wasn't a business person or entrepreneur. Yeah. I ran away from my family's third generation furniture business because, you know, I have to help people. I have to do good. Not that my family's not and they're great yeah. and they're wonderful and they're making people happy on a daily basis by creating a, a warm and loving and inviting space for them to live in, right? But I didn't see that as a particular value in my own emotionality, in my own skill set. Um, so when I first heard this word entrepreneur years ago, and my buddy invited me to this business conference, um, I was like, oh no, I'm not going. I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm a therapist. Thera- therapy is an entrepreneurship until I went to that weekend retreat and um, fell in love with it and realized I truly am an entrepreneur. Um, and the way that I was trained as a therapist is a systemic relational dynamic perspective of yeah. the, you know, we're not looking at a diagnosis. We're not looking at pathology. We're looking at a pattern of interactions between you and whatever you're in dynamic with. And that could be a business, right? Yeah, so right. I, I want people out there to really take this concept of what you're saying, what I'm saying and the theme of everything is we do need help. We do need to go get the the resources and the expertise right. from someone else out there. Coach Michael Bird always says this. He's like, you can't see the you can't see the picture when you're inside the frame. Right. So you don't know if you're a Monet or a Picasso because you're inside of it. Right. And someone like you and I can help them really see not only that you're this really amazing, beautiful pr- product that you can have, but here's the 15, 20 different ways it can be serviced, right? And, and yeah. then created and crafted. And, and I want people out there to really hear that, like right now, especially with what's going on, you might have some ideas out in your brain that you've been thinking about 
that you never would have thought about doing, but now you got to get creative. And right. I know like this has been going around, like one of the memes that has been going around is like the last recession, what Uber and Lyft and Airbnb and um, Venmo and all these other companies came out of the last recession. Right. Yeah, it's innovation. It's but innovation. The, and, and, and it's really helpful. It's always really helpful to have, you know, that outside perspective, just like you talked about. And I, I like the way you framed it. Uh, no pun intended. The, the picture analogy is brilliant. The, um, the other thing, though, is uh, I find, and, and this is the fun part for me, like the, the most fun part is that initial conversation I have with a new client who... I'm like, well, have you thought about this, 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 like you could do this. And, and their eyes just are wide open. Like I never even thought was possible because I, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't come by these gray hairs on my side. If you're watching the video, like I, you know, I didn't get them for free. I've seen a lot of stuff. So I've probably seen the business model. I know how it works. I know where it's going to go South. Like um, just even in, in high ticket program alone, we've worked with you know, 60, 65, 70 different really successful entrepreneurial programs. And we've seen them crash. We've seen them succeed. Like we know what the best practices are. So oftentimes it just takes someone else going, oh, did you know that you have A and B and you can actually plug A and B together and get this amazing thing? And it's like, no, I didn't even know that was possible. So sometimes it just takes that experience of seeing a number of different business models. That's the fun part for me. The fun part is like opening up this wide I'll, I'll give you a quick example if we've got time. So yeah, yeah, one of my time. clients was a um, dietitian. So she, she's doing $50 an hour, you know, like diet elimination. She works with IBS with women, you know? So uh, it, it's like, well, are you eating, you know, <laughs> are you eating fats? Are you eating like, what is it? it and so the biggest problem she had was um, people kept asking her, like, do you take health insurance? <laughs> you yeah. know? And it's like, ah, oh, no, I don't take insurance. Um, so when we started talking and, and, and we realized that, you know, she really wants to work with these women and it's, yes, she wants them to get healthy because she wants them to get back out in the world. Cause the women who really suffer from severe IBS, they're like locked up in their house. They're like tied to the bathroom basically. And so again, if you go to the people who have the biggest pain point, she identified those as like, these are, these are women who are losing five to 10 hours a week because of their symptoms. Right. And you can pay that back when the time we, we, we get the time back for women who are entrepreneurs, right? Because when they get that time back, they can reinvest that time and it's actual money. She's like, but I'm not a business coach. I'm a dietitian. And I'm like, that's okay. You don't have to be. We together crafted this, this program where she basically said, listen, and if you're not, if you're not losing five to 10 hours a week at IBS, I'm not your person. Could go, go hire someone for like 10 bucks an hour to go do an elimination diet to like get that little, mm, that tummy pain to go away. That's not, I, I deal with the serious, serious issues. If you're a female entrepreneur who deals with this, I am going to put you in a group with other female entrepreneurs. I am going to work with you to get five to 10 hours a week back. And then you guys are going to work together as a mastermind to figure out how to reinvest that time. She went from $50 an hour to $10,000 a year on that program because you're, you're combining business models you didn't even think were possible, right? Um, no, and no one's going to ask you if you take health insurance on a $10,000 program like that. <laughs> yeah, that's the fun part. That's the fun part for me. Well, and, it's, and if you think about that, right, that number of $10,000 a year, if you, multi, if you divide that by 12, you know, you're, you're really talking about something that where people are saying it's a long-term investment. Yeah. And in order for this to happen, uh, you know, I love it when people call me and they're like, well, how many sessions do you think it's going to take for us to solve this problem? <laughs> right? And, you know, I'm like, listen, my, my, my hope is that you fire me as soon as possible and you refer all your friends to me because that's how my business grows. But it could take three sessions. It could take 90 days. It could take six years. It really depends on, yeah. you know, and it's those people that when I have my intake forms and I say, is there anything else that you need to know? There's a big blank spot on the intake forms. Is there anything else that you think you, I need to know that might not even be relevant that could help, right? That in a way that I can yeah. help you. And they write a lot of times, they'll just like, no, they'll leave it blank or whatever. Right. And then like eight sessions in, which is like two months in, they're like, oh, by the way, such and such happened. Yeah. <laughs> right. Whether it's an infidelity, whether it's a trauma, right. whether it's right, right. Or, or, you know, 
And I'm like, if you only told me that session one, <laughs> you would have been done already. You That's kind of big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's kind of, kind of a big deal. Like, you know, like, you know, did I, did I do something wrong that I didn't, you know, bring you bring, you know, allow you to bring that up. I'm like, Oh no, no, no. I just didn't think it was relevant. Right. Or, or whatever other story, but like you can see how stuck we all are yeah. in our yeah. own stories. That's and that's why I'm a big fan of, right. My, my belief is that, um, and this is the, the theme of my podcast is that there are four pillars in order to be a successfully full rounded human being. And that's psychology and mindset, spirituality, as it means to the person, natural and alternative wellness and entrepreneurship. And I think when you combine those four things together, the person will have a very beautiful and empowered and purpose-filled life. Yeah. Those are strong, strong principles. And, and I rarely see a successful person who doesn't have something going on in those different areas. In those domains. Right. And that's the whole, that whole, you know, the whole person theory. And if we're not bringing that together, and I'm sure there's stuff like that that you're dealing with, right. Where there's some aspect or angle that they're not addressing that is holding them back from yeah, whatever they need to sure. do in their business. So let's take 30 seconds. And I want to make sure that we get as much positive plugging of your stuff out there. So you also have a podcast and um, that's, you know, focusing on these type of ideas and more. Yep. It's the six to seven figure show. And, uh, you know, again, based, based on our motto of six figure practice to seven figure enterprise, that's, that's kind of what we look at. It's basically, uh, we like to think of every interview as kind of a case study. So I like, I, I talk to folks who are through that journey or well into that journey of uh, moving through and, um, you know, we do a little bit of the context and the fun. So what's going on with you kind of thing, but we really do a lot of shop talk. It's, Hey, so how, how do you handle it when a client does this? And how did you switch over to that model? And so it's a lot of, I like to think of them each as little case studies of, mm -hmm. um, what would be applicable to the broader audience. So that's, uh, they're a lot of fun. Yeah. And I want people to hear that, right? I think that's such a powerful message. One of the, um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Hank Norman from the, like the 10 X circles. He, he created the view. He helped Oprah create the network. He's behind like Grant Cardone and Mel Robbins. Um, you know, he has this thing of like, don't tell me what you do. Show me what you do. Yeah. Right. right. And, and for me as a therapist and for other people out there as, as, as in where there's a HIPAA confidentiality thing, you know, it's very hard. You can't film your therapy sessions and even the whole reality TV show thing is really weird um, ethically <laughs> and how they do that. Right. right. But like we can't go out and like, you know, and even like in multiple States, we can't even have clients write testimonials or reviews for us because it's an empower, you know, it's a, could be a conflict of interest and all those different sure. things. So it's very tough for us. And there's a lot of outdated mentality about that as well. So what I started doing and I'm going to start doing is, is I actually put out to my network of, Hey, who wants to be, on my podcast in exchange for a coaching session. It can't be therapy. It can't be this, 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 and this. Yeah. But if you want some mindset, if you want some help, if you want some strategic thinking, if you want some goal setting, if you want whatever, right. And I will let you know whether it's therapy or not, and you're willing to let that be shared. I will get, I will coach you for free. Right. So I want people out there, like, especially now with whatever business you have, right. If you own a restaurant or you're a chef, teach people how to make your absolute best selling product, right? Yeah. Coach, it's time to innovate. Right. Yeah. Time to innovate. This is the beautiful <clears throat> yep. thing about what's happening. And it's really like, it's really binary. You're either going to play this game because if you're saying I'll wait six months, you're still behind the schedule. Right. Yeah. So I think that's right. Really where I want to empower people. And I love the fact that your podcast does that because I think that's so powerful and it's so useful. It's not just two people randomly. And I, and I, yeah, we know those podcasts are out there. just bullshitting for yeah. the sake of bullshitting, right? <laughs> it, it's, it is, it is that process. And I think people want process. So when you're out there and you're listening to this, whether it's my podcast or you're listening to Frank's podcast, right? And, and you're create or whoever out there is creating your own stuff, talk about the process, talk about the results. And then after that, and then what? Right. right? right. So good. So there's going to be hopefully a then what for us, but I want to challenge people out there who are listening, please go check out his podcast. Um, please listen to an episode that kind of pops up to you. If there's any of the themes on there that seem to you, we leave him a five star written review and uh, do the same for, for, for us here at the U winning life. Every time you guys do that, I just want to explain this to people because I don't know if they get it. Not only is it just about like making us feel good because of course, right. We want to feel good about what we're doing, <laughs> but it does help us get in front of more people that are like-minded to you and I, the listeners and you and I are guests. 
right? Get in front of more people and they find us. I remember, um, you know, mine came up as a suggest. People who are looking for you are also looking for, it was Andy Frisella and Ed Milet. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I like being in the in comparison yeah, with those two yeah, exactly. guys, yeah. right? So, all right, so I'm doing something right here <laughs> when it comes to our but, but that really does help us get in front of more people and that helps yeah. us bring more value and more you know, results and help people who really need to be helped in, in each of our unique fields. So my man, thank you so much thank for you. spending time with us today. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a blast. Thanks for listening to the You Winning Life Podcast. If you are ready to minimize your personal and professional struggles and maximize your potential, we would love it if you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Jason Wasser, LMFT.